uh, does anybody have any questions for her from the judges or from the audience any questions since we have marks separately for question answer session uh, i have a question for you yes ma'am uh, yeah so i just wanted to know one thing that uh, you were talking about vegan diet having several disadvantages so see a person who's been non vegetarian for quite some time and now wants to shift into a vegan diet what would be your advice for the person ma'am a person who has been non vegetarian for uh, quite some years suddenly he wants to change into a vegan diet there might be some deficiency now uh, of nutrients like vitamin b12 vitamin d or omega 3 fatty acids so i would suggest that uh, just after shifting to vegan diet firstly he should uh, he should take supplements of vitamin b sunlight for vitamin d and other supplements like for omega 3 he can take oats or something like that because uh, there might be a defici deficiency otherwise so i think supplements would give some better results thank you well said thank you ma'am okay so devlina das can you start presenting thank you twinkle yes ma'am um good evening respected professors judges and my fellow mates i am debolina das from cndv department same 5 of gokhil college and today i am going to speak on the topic on healthy snacks so i'm starting my presentation now healthy snacks so snacks are foods or drinks that are eaten between meals healthy snacking is a great way to get all the nutrients which help us to stay fit and energetic lifestyles have become increasingly sedentary especially in this pandemic situation in today's society snacking contributes close to one third of daily energy intake motivations to snack choices made with regard to snacking are affected by a multitude of factors like hunger then location social food culture environmental norms distracted eating and hedonic eating as well next importance of snacks snacks help to stabilize blood sugar levels and also promote satiety and suppress overconsumption at subsequent meals it also helps in prevention of diseases and diabetes protection against aging prevention of constipation maintenance of mental activity and further more importances are there some more importance are snacking and heart health frequent eating may improve the lipid profiles and decrease the risk of cardiovascular diseases it is seen that nibbling pattern is found to be associated with lower total and ldl cholesterol concentrations and blood pressure it has also a healthy impact on weight maintenance it is seen that nutrient dense snack foods are associated with weight loss or weight maintenance whereas energy dense snack foods are associated with weight gain thus effect of snack foods on body weight are found to be mixed next healthy snacking at home this pandemic has led us spending more time now at home which may lead to munching on less healthy snacks however we all know that health is very important to us and therefore there are many healthy snack choices which provides essential nutrients without adding on too many calories sugar salt saturated fat etc children should have proper snacks which helps to boost their energy level and also improves their academic records they should focus mainly on mini meal than meal breakers cookie cutter sandwiches can be introduced to children as it can excite them and to have proper healthy snacks to fuel more active teens and adults snacks can contain 200 to 300 calories per serving eating different combinations of food can be very satisfying and help to hung curb hunger too so i've listed here certain healthy snack ideas which can be prepared at home easily 
वी कैन इजिली प्रिपेयर होम मेड स्मूदी और लस्सी और होम मेड ट्रेल मिक्स और वी कैन प्रिपेयर वे प्रोटीन शेक हार्ड बॉइल एग्स फ्रोजन यूगर्ट पॉपिकल्स चिया पुडिंग और एप्पल और बैनाना स्लाइसेस टॉप विथ पीनट बटर और आमंड बटर एसेट्रा One must always carry healthy snacks outside home too, as it's a great way to stay energized and productive. Wholesome snacks are easy to make, portable, nutritious, and can be stored easily. I've listed here certain healthy snacks which we can carry outside, such as chickpeas, sprouts, then sandwiches, then whole wheat biscuits, brown rice cakes, etc. snacks should be conscious deliberate mindful and satisfying but not all snacks are equal there are certain pitfalls that should be identified and addressed we should not be doing mindless eating in boredom or stress eating snack foods instead of real foods which are poor in nutrients should be prevented we we should always maintain the hunger quotient we should always be slightly between slightly satisfied and slightly hungry all the times and skipping meals can result in overeating therefore we should maintain them and should prevent them this brings us to the conclusion that the key to great snack is getting the right balance of nutrients which will provide satiety and give energy until next meal and the most important is staying healthy and fit i have attached here few recent research papers here the first research paper is from may 2019 which gives us a brief idea about the eating habits and the sustainable food production in the development of innovative healthy snacks that are not only ready for immediate consumption but are also unique in terms of nutritional value and contain minimum number of additives my second research paper is from march 2018 which aims to provide a comprehensive snapshot of snacking recommendations worldwide Lastly, I have attached a few references from where I have done my presentation on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Devlina. Uh, any questions from the audience or judges? Okay, so if there are no questions, then we'll move on to the next student, that is Nikhat Khatun. Nikhat, can you please start presenting? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nikhat Khatun from semester five. See, see, I'm going to present a presentation on depression and breakdown. I think you're having a network issue, Nikhat. It's not audible properly. Ma'am, is my screen visible? Yes, your screen is visible. Ah, uh, so first we uh, need to know what is breakfast. I think everyone knows what is breakfast. It is basically uh, the most important meal of the day, and it is uh, eaten after uh, we wake up, and uh, it is very important for us as it um, it is a. Uh, implicated uh, in weight control cardio metabolic risk factor and cognitive performance although at present the literature remain inclusive as to the precise health benefits of breakfast now we need to know what is depression depression is a common mental disorder that uh, that results in depressed mood loss of interest pleasure decreased energy and feeling of guilt or self worth and nowadays uh, depression often comes with symptoms of anxiety the the problem becomes chronic or recurrent and leads to substantial impairment in individual's ability to take care of his or her everyday responsibility at worst depression can lead to suicide which is so common nowadays now what if we are skipping our breakfast now skipping breakfast can be potential harmful because breakfast consumption is considered one of the important health related behavior that benefits health and physical and mental health 
As the rate of depression has increased recently, we invest investigated the association between the frequency of eating breakfast and depression in adults. Now, what if we are consuming breakfast and their relationship with depression? There is an inverse association between breakfast consumption and depression, anxiety and psychological distress. The risk of depressive symptoms tend to increase with decreasing frequency of breakfast. Eating breakfast regularly leads to improved mood, better memory, more energy and feeling of calmness. Now, if we see the relation between breakfast and mental health, so obviously if we are not eating our breakfast, then we are tend to be depressed, less emotionally distressed and have lower level of perceived stress than those who did eat their breakfast. And uh, in conclusion, there is uh, an uh, association between breakfast consumption and well-being that cannot be entirely be accounted for by the difference in other aspects of diet or smoking and alcohol consumption. Now, diet and depression. If a, a dietary pattern is characterized by high consumption of red or processed meat, refined grain, sweets, high-fat dairy products, butter, potatoes, and high-fat gravy, and low intakes of fruits and vegetables, then it is associated with increased risk of depression. Now, there are some research paper. In this research paper, we came to know if we are having energy drink, caffeine, junk food and all, then our academic performance gets lower and we are more depressed as compared to other students. In the, in the second research paper, we came to know that if we are skipping our break, uh, breakfast, then we are more depressed and the rate of depression increases. Here are the references which I have used. Thank you. So, any questions from anybody regarding breakfast and depression? Judges? Uh, yes. Uh, so, Nikhat, uh, can you please elaborate exactly how does skipping your breakfast make you depressed? Okay. Uh, uh, Ma'am, first of all, if you're not uh, having a proper meal in the beginning of the day, we might feel uh, lethargy to the whole day and we are unable to focus on our studies and all that and then ma'am it will substantially lead to depression okay actually it has got a lot to do with a bit of hormones also and uh, yeah also calorie deficit throughout the day will make you feel tired and depressed but uh, there are other hormones like cortisol and all involved in making you feel happy, hungry, depressed and all that. Actually, I wanted to ask you the same question, but I didn't. That yes, you should have spoken about hormones involved in maintaining your mental health. Which hormones are responsible for like giving you good feeling? Which hormones actually are giving you negative feelings? So that would have helped you in describing how if you don't take breakfast, you will suffer from depression. Okay, thank you, Nikhat. Uh, can we have the next presentation? Lopa Mudra, you are there. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm here. Uh, good evening, ma'am, and good evening, everyone. I'm Lopa Mudra Dash from CNDV department. So, ma'am, can I present? Yes, please begin. And I think uh, Dr. Gautam Mahata has also joined us. Yes, please begin your presentation. Is my uh, presentation is visible? Yes, your slide is visible. Yes. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to present about diet and uh, its chosen relationship in female body. So first we have to know what is estrogen. So we all know that estrogen is a hormone and it is uh, made by the body that helps uh, develop and maintain female sex characteristics and the growth of long bones. 
so first uh, there is some function histogen has have some functions so the functions are like first function is estrogen play important role development of female secondary characteristics and that's why estrogen cause of female sex hormone uh, and uh, like a female secondary sex characteristics such as breast and wider hips pubic hair and armpit hair and also estrogen helps regulate the menstrual cycle controlling the growth of the uterine lining during the first part of the cycle if the woman egg is not fertilized estrogen levels decrease sharply and menstruation begins if the egg is fertilized estrogen work with progesterone and, and another hormone to stop ovulation during pregnancy and also estrogen is instrumental in bone formation working with vitamin d calcium and other hormones to effectively break down and reveal bones according to the body's natural process and also estrogen uh, play a role in that causing and also during pregnancy the placenta products estrogen especially the hormone estrogen and estrogen controls the lactation and other changes in breasts including at the adolescence and during pregnancy and also uh, estrogen maintain the strength and thickness of the vaginal wall and the lubrication uh, and a host of other bodily functions and uh, also every hormone is a good and bad effect so estrogen has also good uh, some good effect like uh, estrogen helps stimulate the growth of the egg follicle and estrogen enhances and maintains the mucus uh, the membrane that lines the uterus it also regulates the flow and the thickness of uterine mucus secretions and next is the body uses estrogen in the formation of breast tissue estrogen also helps stop the flow of milk after weaning and estrogen helps in causing physical differentiation of the fetus uh, to either males or females as per their genetic code and estrogen is uh, considered to play a significant role in women's mental health sudden decrease in the blood levels of estrogen and period sustained estrogen low levels correlate with significant mood lowering next is estrogen improve collagen content and quality increase skin thickness and improve blood supply to the skin estrogen act by estrogen receptors on human skin and estrogen has found to be responsible for initiating spermatogenesis or formation or formation and maturation of sperms in men and also estrogen is main important for maintaining bone mass primarily by retarding bone resorption estrogen controls the action of parathyroid hormone and also estrogen also increase good cholesterol and also increase uh, triglycerides and they also decrease ldl promotes fat depositions and also estrogen have some bad effect uh, like estrogen uh, actually first is estrogen risk of uh, breast cancer uh, like estrogen uh, it was established over 15 year ago that that uh, serum estrogen level can account for difference in breast cancer risk estrogen and breast uh, is experimental data strongly suggested that estrogen have a role in the development and the growth of breast cancers estrogens are considered to play a major role in promoting the proliferation of bone the normal and the neoplast breast epithelium and also uh, it also increase endometrial cancer post menstrual uterine bleeding may occur and also uh, like high estrogen also increase the risk of nausea breast tenderness and also hypertension ovary cancer and leading some autoimmune disease and also uh, estrogen also used for clinically it is also used like hormonal replacement thera therapy in women after menopause due to the cessation of ovary in function and as estrogen progesterone hrt therapy supervision of uh, vasomotor instability and also estrogen is uh, used on gonadal diagnosis and primary ovarian insufficiency and also estrogen also it is important for oral con uh, uh, contraceptive pill it is also used uh, and also used in moderate uh, ones vulgaris and prevention of osteoporosis and symptoms associated with menopause and also uh, 
estrogen and uh, the main topic is estrogen and brand diet relationship in female body the diet associate uh, there is study some research paper shows that uh, that diet has a uh, diet and estrogen has some uh, relationship first is diet associated with high uh, estrogen some studies show that uh, some diet uh, like dietary choices can affect hormonal health and influence estrogen me metabolism and excretion certain dietary patterns may lead to overweight and obesity which may increase estrogen in the body studies have shown that some dietary pattern may promote estrogen dominance and the risks of medical condition associated with imbalance uh, like for example many studies have found that western type dietary patterns like uh, by high intakes of red meat processed food sweet dairy and refined grains are considerably associated with high estrogen level and also diets that promote healthy estrogen levels certain diet that have shown to promote high healthy estrogen levels and body weight while significantly uh, reducing disease risk uh, that are like um, studies have shown that diets that focus on whole nutrient dense foods especially vegetables and fruits help encourage healthy levels of estrogen and then is a uh, fiber rich diet research so, uh, shows that fiber rich diet such as those high in whole grains may help reduce estrogen levels and also plant be, be, plant based diet promote healthy estrogen levels like vegetables and also legumes also uh, like uh, increase uh, decrease to health uh, estrogen level study show that this type of diet help to decrease 40% of estrogen level in women and there is some research paper first research paper is diet and estrogen relationship and second is there is a uh, how estrogen is associated with breast cancer and there is some uh, reference uh, some research paper and some pdf that's it okay any questions for lopa mudra on her presentation estrogen and diet and one thing lopa yes, mudra I, I, I have a question Okay, Shubhangi, you finished. Oh, then I'll Lopa Mudra. Yes. Uh, Lopa Mudra, uh, can you yes, tell me the relationship between calcium and estrogen? Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, uh, calcium, uh, estrogen also associated with calcium and vitamin D to rebonding the bone according to the body structure. Okay, and how, um, if I ask you to plan a diet for a post-menopausal uh, woman, uh, what would you suggest? Ma'am, I uh, suggest them uh, like vegetables and also uh, like plant-based vegetables and also I uh, uh, white meat. I think ma'am is asking you that as your topic is diet and estrogen, so what is the interrelationship between calcium and estrogen? How estrogen will affect calcium levels in our body? Will it affect our bones? That's the question. Right, Shubhangi? Yes. So can you just say that? Yes, ma'am. I say that uh, estrogen also like uh, estrogen also associated uh, also associated with uh, calcium and vitamin D D, and they helps uh, and they helps to uh, rebonding the bone uh, according to their body structure. I think you require more clarification on this thing that how uh, estrogen is. Maintaining the bone health. Okay, you can read it properly. Achha, and one more thing for everybody: when you are presenting, try to use slideshow because what happens is some of your slides otherwise are not properly visible. The matter is too minute for us to see. So try to use the slideshow. Uh, I have one question for Lopa Mudra. Um, yes. Hal. Yes, Lopa Mudra. Uh, what? From one of your slides, uh, you showed that uh, there is some relationship between estrogen, high estrogen level, and some kind of diet. Yes, so, uh, can you uh, can you explain what is the I mean, how? What is the mechanism? How uh, yes. Uh, some research paper shows that uh, high estrogen diet means diet uh, like uh, some diet like red meat, sweet dairy, uh, dairy product, refined grains that are associated with high estrogen they also increase the estrogen level in our body 
there must be a mechanism. Do you know the mechanism? I mean, uh, what what are those diets doing in our body? Actually, ma'am, uh, if we uh, like eat uh, uh, like red meat and sweets and dairy products and refined grains, then obesity will occur. Uh, may occur and also then a breast cancer will occur and if we uh, like mechanism is uh, study uh, like so show that if we eat that then estrogen level will increase and then uh, obesity will happen and then breast cancer may happen uh, i think you need more reading about it because uh, i'm not totally satisfied it's okay you can read more I want to know, uh, I actually wanted to know about the mechanism because one cannot just wait for obesity to happen, you know. <laughs> so, uh, ma'am, uh, if we eat uh, like uh, this type of things and then obviously, uh, like research show that then estrogen level will high and obviously there is a relationship between estrogen yes, and yes, what cancer, cancer. breast yes, cancer yes. and if we eat uh, like uh, if we eat this type of things then obviously breast cancer will happen and uh, uh, then also it may uh, it may uh, be uh, obesity will happen uh, okay it's not still quite clear to me but it's okay mm. thank you Lupa Mantra. okay so next presentation should be by Shreya Ghosh Shreya are you there Uh, you are not audible. Please put your speaker on, Shreya. Yes, ma'am, now. Yes, please continue. Uh, good afternoon to all my respected teachers, seniors, and juniors. I am Shreya Khus, Department of Clinical Nutrition and Dietetics, Semester 5 in Gokul Memorial Girls College. Uh, my topic is about healthy breakfast. Uh, here I am presenting my presentation. Let's do introduce my presentation. Ma'am, is it visible? Yes, your slide is visible. Please continue. As the, uh, as the name of breakfast suggested, that it breaks the first thing the night before. It is the first and the main meal of the day. Breakfast is essential for good health. We should choose to take healthy breakfast every day. What is healthy breakfast? Healthy breakfast means that uh, gives more nutrients, macronutrients like carbohydrate, protein, fat and micronutrients also. So we uh, should start our day to eat healthy breakfast. Here I am presenting some chart of different areas uh, of breakfast and uh, among them what is healthy and what is unhealthy breakfast are also given in the slide. Next, what is uh, increase the quality of breakfast? Here I am presenting some points. Instead of it, some cooking process like uh, pressure cooking, boiling also increases the quality of breakfast. And there is in variety in color, texture of breakfast menu should be maintained. And we choose to local ingredients to make our breakfast, which is easily available. Uh, next slide is... Uh, we should use some point uh, to make healthy breakfast that are including we use whole grain instead of refined grain that uh, that we get more fiber and we also include the vegetables fruits is, uh, and we also includes the low fat dairy products to avoid obesity cvd and diabetes Uh, instead of it, we make breakfast as a balanced diet and we have to choose food from at least three to four gr uh, food groups from five food groups and mix them uh, to make a healthy breakfast. Breakfast is important uh, meal. It has many advantages. It gives more nutrients and it also helps to improve the health, helps to weight loss, weight gain and maintain the health and lower the risk of many chronic disease lower the ldl level and cholesterol there is a positive link between the cognitive and academic function it improves the memory uh, and the test grades and psychological function on the other hand breakfast has many uh, uh, skipping breakfast increase 
the disadvantages of skipping breakfast are there is many cause of skipping breakfast like there is social economic status ignorance some people waking up late in the morning some are suffering from constipation and some people uh, feel bored when the breakfast item uh, it becomes monotony what is the effect of the uh, skipping breakfast it increases uh, the risk of chronic disease cvd type 2 diabetes obesity it uh, increase the level of stress irritability and cravings later in the day for unhealthy snacks and drinks here i am presenting uh, two breakfast item made by me procedure ingredients here is some research paper first research paper say that the breakfast reduce the level of stress and depression give positive energy to do work and increase the concentration and breakfast is highly needed meal for um, uh, growth and development of the children and second research paper says that 10 to 30% of european and also many indians skip their breakfast as the breakfast is beneficial meal and important for our health not uh, we should not skip our breakfast here is some references that we uh, that i am using for my presentation thank you to all of you uh, listen and watch my presentation okay thank you shreya anybody has any questions for her i have one question for you shreya can you name some whole grains like you said that it's better to include whole grains in the breakfast so can you give me some examples of those Man, whole wheat flour. Okay. Um, whole wheat flour you have mentioned in your slide. Anything else? There are many whole grains which we can include. Man, in our diet. Uh, brown rice. Okay. And makhana. Okay. Our breakfast time only ki ki. Man, breakfast time our makhana or brown rice usually khabo na. Breakfast time only, Kiki whole grains include whole grains. Ma'am, brown bread. Okay. Are? What about oats and dalia, suji, right? Muesli. These can be included as whole grains in the breakfast. So, anybody has any questions for Shreya? If not, then we'll move to the next presentation. Uh, I have a question for Shreya. Yeah, sure, Shreya. Sure. Yes. Uh, Shreya, uh, uh, can you tell me uh, uh, in our breakfast, uh, means what do you think means according to you, uh, which nutrient should be dense in our breakfast? Uh, we should uh, use carbohydrate and protein to make our breakfast. Okay, and can you say why do you think so? Carbohydrate gives uh, more um, more than seventy percent of the total energy, and uh, as we say that uh, breakfast is the first meal, so uh, we included carbohydrate in it, and protein uh, is helps to um, making the body and the bone so. We, Include the protein to improve our health. Okay, Shreya. Okay. Uh, Shreya, I have a question for you too. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, Shreya, as I was, I wanted to know that uh, you know uh, exactly after waking up from sleep. How much gap should be between the time you wake up and you have your breakfast and why so? Do you have any idea about that? It's between one, hour, one and one and a half hours. But why? I don't know. Uh, it is basically because like see when you go to sleep and then you wake up in the morning. So there might be a drop in your blood glucose levels if you are giving more gap. Okay. So that's not a good thing, right? So that's why the gap should not be more than one to one and a half hours. You, are, you gave the correct answer. So that's good. Okay. okay thank you. Uh, 
please, Ritika, can you start presenting? Ritika Biswas. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, please start presenting. Ma'am, my video. Yes, you are visible, audible. You can start. Hello, very good evening to all of you. Today, I'm showing. Excuse me. I'm Ritika Biswas. Semester of student of the Indian Department, Bukhan Manoa Girls College. Today, my topic for this webinar is software versus blender. Before starting anything about software and blender specifically, we should know about what is the balanced diet and or therapeutic diet. So basically, a balanced diet is a diet which contains all the nutrients like carbohydrates, protein, fat, calories, vitamins, minerals, everything in proper amount so that it can meet the requirements of an individual or a group. So when someone is sick or someone needs some elimination or addition of some nutrients or from to the diet or from the diet, then we need some modifications to this balanced diet. So then that modified version of balanced diet is called the therapeutic diet. So as for my topic, soft diet and bland diet, if they both are two kinds of therapeutic diets. Now there is a misconception that bland diet and soft diet, they are same. Or someone say, not someone, many people say that a uh, bland diet is also called a soft diet or low residue diet. But this is of course not true. So I am going to focus on what is exactly the difference between soft diet and bland diet. So first and the main difference lies in the definition itself. So the soft diet is the diet which contains the food substances which are soft in texture, which should be simple, easy to digest, easy to chew, where should there should not be no fiber, I mean no harsh fiber and no highly sweetened flavors. And the bland diet, it is the diet which contains the food substances which are mechanically, chemically and thermally non irritating Now what are these? The mechanically irritating food substances examples are uh, uh, one second, I'm just interrupting you, Ritika. Okay. Are you going to present your slide? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to ask her. Your presentation is just, not showing. Yes, Ritika. I was just thinking that probably you're introducing your topic and then starting. But then I realized not showing, that you're, okay. no, your, yes, presentation your presentation is not, is not showing. showing. I think you should start again because mm -hmm. meanwhile, I was just thinking you're introducing your topic. Now okay, I realize that you're reading from your presentation. I mean, then I'm trying again. Yeah, you start again. I'll let you know if your presentation is showing or not. Okay. No, is my screen visible? Yes. Yes. Now it's visible. Okay. Ami, can you see? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I will start. Okay, no, I will start again. Yes. So as I was saying, my topic is soft diet versus bland diet. So basically, I will start again. First, before anything specifically about soft diet and bland diet, we should know what is exactly a balanced diet and the therapeutic diet. So a balanced diet is a diet which contains all the nutrients like carbohydrates, protein, fat, vitamins, minerals in a proper amount so that it can meet the requirements of an individual or a group. When someone is sick or someone needs some elimination or addition to this diet or from this diet, then we do some modifications or changes. That modified diet is called the therapeutic diet. Now, as for my topic, soft diet and bland diet, they both are two kinds of therapeutic diet or the modified version of normal balanced diet. Always, many people say that uh, soft diet and bland diet, they both are same. There is no difference, but of course, it's not true. So, as for my presentation, I will focus on what is the exact difference between soft diet and bland diet. The first and the major difference between these lies in the definition. So, the soft diet is the diet which contains um, food substances which are soft in texture, simple, easy to digest, easy to chew and which are uh, no, which are devoid of any harsh fiber and highly seasoning or flavors. And the bland diet is the diet which contains the food substances which are mechanically, chemically and thermally non-irritating. Now what are these? The mechanical thing, irritate, 
the mechanical irritant means like uh, wheat bran or uh, germ then peels of fruits and vegetables etc the chemically irritating food means of uh, caffeine or spices or alcohol and thermal irritating food substances means like uh, ice cream or food which are either too hot or too cold now the second difference between the soft that and the bland that is the condition in which they are administered like soft that is basically administered in a few infections or gi disorders or in after surgery to recover phase and also for those who have dental problems who cannot chew or uh, even the soft that is also uh, administered to the patient to the in the hospital who are undergoing the diagnosis and bland that is basically given to the patient for ulcers then uh, grd or gastroesophageal reflux disease or uh, gastro gastroenteritis and inflammatory bowel disease or ibd then diverticulosis or heartburn or after surgery during recovery phase for faster recovery these are the main difference between soft that and bland that now i will show what are exactly similarities for which it, there is a misconception that these two are same so basically there are two points one is there should be no harsh fiber and no strong flavors it's right that these two char characteristic or the criteria that present in both kind of diet but if we check in depth so we can see that the bland diet is more and more restrictive than that of a soft diet bland diet should not be i mean they should be devoid of this thing they should we have to restrict those things in case of bland diet but mainly soft diet mainly focuses on the texture of the food but bland diet is mainly focus on the constituents of the food so these are some research papers that i have used for this this is a research paper of 2019 which is which is updated on 2021 It says that bland diet actually uh, gives rise to GI tract and also cause less bowel movement. And uh, there is a one. It actually uh, says that if we consume soft diet for a longer run or for a very long time, so it may interfere with the development of normal mastication function. And these are some references that I have used to make this presentation. And thank you so much for listening to me patiently. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ritika. Very good. So, any questions from judges or audience for her? Yes, I have a question for Ritika. Yeah, hello, Ritika. Uh, yes, Ritika. Uh, can you give me some example of soft diet and bland diet? Did you give it in your presentation? Okay. Did you? Uh, soft diet basically, uh, the food comes as like a uh, fruit puree or stewed vegetables, any kind of vegetables. It can be or uh, Then uh, we can include soups also. Yeah, soup in soft diet. Soft diet. Okay. And then bland diet. Is soup is given in soft diet, Ritika? Mm -hmm. That's why I, I, I am just uh, mm -hmm. soft. Yeah. Manaki soup. So, तुम्हारे liquid uh, diet होएगा अच्छा ना? हाँ माँ. Fluid diet. तो मैं नहीं कि pureed or stewed, which are soft in texture. Yeah. Uh, go on. Go on. Bland. Bland diet. Bland diet. Uh, bland diet is like uh, uh, like uh, if I have said that uh, in bland diet which uh, cannot con uh, which cannot I contain coffee. Well, I don't uh, want no, no. to hear about the theory okay. anymore. I just want uh, one or two example. Apply your common sense. I think you can. You you know. Bland diet, you know. I'm is asking you example. Yes. Bland yes. diet, food okay. item example. Okay. Uh, like we can get kitchri also in case of bland diet. Okay. Anything else mm. other than kitchri? That uh, then in case uh, in place of tea or coffee, we can give milk. La in bland diet, you were confusing between uh, no. liquid. And bland and soft, you know, milk. I'm milk telling you, uh, like uh, if uh, like in the breakfast before breakfast in the early morning, when normally people consume tea or coffee, in that place we can get milk. That yes, that but yes, uh, you can always give milk, but milk doesn't comes under bland diet. Mm -hmm. 
okay i think you should read more about it uh, about the uh, different uh, examples you know mm -hmm. you just gave the theory didn't uh, give any kind of example you should include you should always include exa examples in your presentation okay mm -hmm. thank you thank you ashmita so ritika this thing is clear for you i think and for everybody else also that whichever topic you are presenting you should have total clear insight into that particular topic so i think you need to do a little bit more reading about bland diet okay so next presentation should be by shalmoli nag are you there shalmoli yes please start presenting good evening one and all i am shalmoli from clinical nutrition and dietetics department of semester 5 gokhil college and today i am going to present a slide show on a growth and development milestones in uh, from conception to adolescence Are you yes. sharing your presentation? Yes. Yes, your presentation is visible. Yes. Firstly, what is growth and what is development? Growth is defined as the change in size in proportion and disappearances of old features and getting new ones whereas development is a process of change in growth and also the capability over time due to function of both maturation and interaction with our surrounding growth does not continue throughout life whereas development continues throughout life growth stop after maturation and development is progressive and continues throughout whole life growth occurs due to multiplication of cells and development occurs due to both maturation and interaction with environment the changes produced by growth are subjects of measurements they can be quantified and observed whereas development brings qualitative changes which are difficult to measure they are assessed by observation of behavior in various situations growth may or may not bring development but development is possible without growth some factors which affect growth and development are heredity hormones race sex nutrition infections genetic disorders trauma drugs and alcohol and tobacco usage cultural practices environmental factors socio economic statuses normative influences education and training fetal growth and development during first trimester the amniotic sac and amniotic fluid develops the placenta also develops the neural tube is quite well formed the digestive tract and sensory organs slowly begin to develop and blood cells are made in the bone marrow fetus around uh, this time weighs about 45 grams in the second trimester which is 4 to 6 months reproductive organs are almost fully formed the fingers toenails eyelids nails hairs are formed teeth and bones become much more denser there are very fine hair covering the fetal body known as lanugo skin covered by whitish coating are called vernix caseosa uh fingerprints begin to form around this time fetus about uh, around this time is about 820 grams in third trimester which is during 7 to 9 months reserves of body fat develops brain also starts to develop rapidly fetal eye will opens slightly the lung is nearly fully developed baby starts to respond to sounds lights and touch a full term baby weighs around 3400 grams 
infancy from birth to 12 months. A newborn weighs about 2 to 3.5 kgs around birth. The newborn also grows and is born with instant uh, reflexes such as sucklim reflex, rooting reflex, moro reflex, palmer reflex, Babinski reflex. So they turn their heads towards sound and are stirred startled by loud noises. Head and trunk controls are quite well after a first few months. They can roll over their stomach and to back. They are gradually able to pull. Uh, uh, they are gradually able to pull into sitting positions and they begin crawling soon after. They are ab able to stand while holding a furniture. This time, the child has separation anxiety and forms attachments with the caregiver. Toddlers, one to three years. In this age, the child tends to gain around three to five pounds in weight, developing of strength and coordination also increases and they are able to recall some of the previous events. They also like to imitate others, those who surround them. They start to master walking and after that they soon move on to running. May, they may stumble frequently and this time they are quite accident prone. They begin using two or more words together. At this time, they are emotionally attached to their toys and objects in which they may find comfort. During this time, terrible twos period may begin with some children who are where the child is quite stubborn and throws tantrums. Preschoolers, three to six years, around this time, they gain about three inches in height and three to five pound in weight. They easily run, climb, catch balls, pedal tricycles, etc. They can identify color, they can count, few numbers and remember their favorite stones. They start to have clearer speech and they can memorize and write poems, recite poems. They can tell their names to others. At this time, they show an independent streak where they want to do their work on their own. Sometimes they are quite demanding and sometimes cooperative. They want to mix with other children of their own age and play with them. They show a wide range of emotions. School goers, six to 12 years. They have a steady growth around six, four to two to four inches in height and five to seven pounds in weight yearly. Eye coordination is eye to hand coordination is quite good at this time and they can ace certain skills like writing, drawing, cutting in crafts and all of them. Logical thinkers, they are quite the logical thinkers during this time and they can consider others viewpoints. They have quite the concrete thinking and they can reflect upon their actions. Understanding concept of space, time and dimension are also their forte around this time. They find their strength and weaknesses, and they are more effective coping skills. They understand the concept of right and wrong that are taught by their caregivers. They are quite sensitive to others' opinions about them. Adolescents, 13 to 19 years. Adolescence period sees a growth spurt and is the onset of puberty. Hormones such as estrogen and testosterone cause secondary sexual characters like growth of underarm hair, facial hair, pubic hair, development of breasts, shoulders, broaden, etc. Onset of menarche among females ha also happens in this period. Also in this time, voice box or larynx grows and becomes quite huger than before and the voice becomes deeper. At this time, the children, these teenagers think quite hypothetically and logically and they can introspect.
they strive they strive to gain social acceptance and seeks to speak spend less time with family and friends more time with friends they have they have difficulty in maintaining their self esteem now in this research paper it is found that uh, when the auditory evoked reflex and brain oscillatory changes when the human voice is processed through magnetoencephalography system uh, then it is seen that when human voice is processed then the then the uh, auditory uh, then the auditory uh, evoked fields and oscillatory brain oscillatory are higher when a uh, human voice is human voice is processed through it and uh, it is related to intelligence and cognition in this research paper it is shown that socio economic disadvantage disadvantages causes childhood during childhood adversity causes low, low or less myelin growth in in adolescents and young adults which further which affect their health these are some of the references that i have used for this presentation okay shivali so thank you but i think you have highly exceeded your time we are supposed to maintain the time limit of 5 minutes okay any questions from the judges or audience students nobody is asking any question uh, uh, yes uh, hello shalmoli hello ma'am Uh, Shalmali, in your presentation, you have explained about the growth and development milestones and everything, uh, but you have explained us the theory portion. Uh, I only want to ask you again about a very practical example by sh uh, by seeing a child. Uh, how can you differentiate between the growth and what is the growth and what is the development of the child? Yes, ma'am. We can monitor growth by measuring their height or their weight or their head circumference whereas uh, development we can see like they learn new skills they they are good with people they are socially interactive they are learning new words each and every day some uh, some small milestones like learning to throw a ball and first steps a baby's first walking things like that we can measure development like my child is developing learning things one by one once at a time so this is how it yes. is yes thank you sharma thank you ma'am okay thank you uh, now rajrupa can you start your presentation yes ma'am good evening good afternoon to my all respected teachers my seniors my classmates and my juniors today i'm rajrupa shorkar from clinical nutrition and dietetics department semester 5 gokhil memorial girls college today my topic is uh, amyloidosis which is the deposition of amyloid into a body i'm presenting my presentation amyloidosis is an abnormal protein disorder um if we look at the definition we can see that um, amyloidosis is a disorder of protein folding in which various proteins uh, second rajrupa sorry i am interrupting you to be bodh hai mobile theke screen share to korcho kintu eta theke ki are ekটু boro kora jay na keno pora jacche na eta um you can rotate the screen rajrupa you can rotate the screen Yes. Ma'am is it visible now? Yes, it's visible. Please continue. Okay. Uh, so uh, as I'm telling the definition 
amyloidosis is a disorder of protein folding in which various proteins are able to auto aggregate in a highly abnormal fibril conformation. Amyloid fibrils accumulate in the extracellular space and the deposits progressively disrupt the structure and function of tissue and organs throughout the body. Now if we locate at the types, we can see there are two major types. One is systemic amyloidosis and another one is the hereditary systemic amyloidosis. In systemic amyloidosis, which is, uh, which is further classified into four major types, uh, systemic light chain amyloidosis, systemic amyloid A amyloidosis, dialysis related amyloidosis and senile systemic amyloidosis. Then comes the hereditary systemic amyloidosis. Hereditary systemic amyloidosis can be divided into two parts, neuropathic and uh, non-neuropathic. So neuropathic form is further divided into two types. One is hereditary uh, transthyretin amyloidosis and another one is hereditary gasoline amyloidosis. Non-neuropathic form is also further divided into four parts which are fibrinogen AA chain amyloidosis hereditary apolipoprotein AL amyloidosis and apolipoprotein all amyloidosis and lysosomal amyloidosis. If we look at, at the causes, there are chronic, uh, chronic inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis and chronic bacterial infections like tuberculosis, bronchitis, malignant neoplasm, proliferative disease of blood system and subcutaneous drug abuse like development of a amyloidosis now there is some risk factor which can increase this disease like age there is a high risk of getting a amyloidosis if the person is getting older or older than 40 years old there is gender that amyloidosis is more common in men than women and there is other diseases and mainly the family history if the heredity uh, contains the disrupted gene, heredity amyloidosis can run in family. In symptoms, we can see there is swelling of ankles and legs, diarrhea possible with blood or constipation and irregular heartbeat, shortness of breath with minimal excretion and enlarged tongue which sometimes look triple around its age. There are some figures which are visible if the person is uh, having these diseases. In the diagnosis, we can uh, diagnose by imaging the potential affected areas like SAP, uh, the cardiac MRI or echocardiography, the CT MRI and um, if we investigate the organ involvement for cardiac, we can do ECG, echocardiography, NT pro BNP, cardiac trophin and for renal, we can use uh, urine dipstick, renal function, qualification of proteinuria. For liver, the liver function test, the soft tissues, clinical examinations can be done. And for neurological system, clinical examinations, uh, nerve conducting studies, autonomic functions, tested. For fibril typing, we can uh, use immunoglobed uh, EM particles, mass spectrometry and direct fibril sequences. If we see the management, um, there is some dietary man management I have showed that uh, we can um, more simple, uh, uh, more complex carbohydrate we can take like bread, pasta, like cereals, rice rather than a more simple carbohydrate um, sugar and uh, protein helps to build new cells and replace the old one. So for protein, we can take dietary products, dairy products, sorry. Uh, nuts, beans, pulses, meats and fish. Vitamin, uh, vitamin absorption is for fat, um, sorry, for fat is essential for vitamin absorption. A healthy diet consists of more fat for fish, nuts, seeds and oil, olive oil. Um, we have to take fiber as fiber is maintain our healthy digestive system. For that, the fruits and vegetables is needed. Vitamins and minerals are essential for body's ability to resist infection and to maintain the healthy nerves tissues. So brightly colored fruits and vegetables such as broccoli, carrot, oranges, pepper and uh, tomatoes are a rich source of vitamins and minerals but there is no specific recommendation for vitamin supplements. 
fluid must be restricted of, as overloaded fluid causes swelling in feet, ankles, lower legs, abdomen, difficulty in breathing. Here is some research paper I have attached which shows that um, the main disease about the disease of amyloidosis, how this is occurring to the old age people and how the person can diagnose the disease, what are the causes and how we can manage it. These research paper also showed that pathogens under new therapeutic options like the mechanisms of tissue damage, clinical features of all amyloidosis diagnosis and treatment. There are some references which um, I have taken help from to create my presentation. Thank you so much for staying with me. So any questions for her, Rajupa? Any questions for Rajupa? No? Uh, then we'll move on to the last presentation, which is by Maria Jamal. And one thing, Rajrupa, uh, always for everybody also, this is applicable. Make sure that whatever figures you are giving or writing you are given in the slide, it should be completely visible, clearly visible. So one diagram you had shown, uh, that figure was not visible at all for diagnosis. Okay, and also try to maintain the time frame allotted. Okay, thank you. Achha, okay, next sir. last time, sir. Hey, Rajrupa. Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, you have told our, uh, you have given a very good uh, the presentation on our introduction. But I have a question that uh, is there any division, primary or secondary amyloidosis like that? Uh, which so are what? often called primary amyloidosis. Uh, so for that we can diagnose um, I'm not sure about I'm very sorry sir I'm not sure about this primary secondary and uh, last stage of amyloidosis but uh, there is some stages we can after diagnosis we can understand and uh, Rajupa one more thing uh, in your type of amyloidosis we have said something all amyloidosis i don't think that that is all i think that a2 a1 and a2 i think yes yes a1 a5 maybe yeah. yes. one are called primary it's and another is called uh, secondary it's not all amyloidosis it's um, i don't think that no okay ma'am thank you ma'am thank you uh, last presentation by maria jamal Maria, are you there? Is Maria Jamal there? Yes, Maria, can you please start presenting? Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Uh, good afternoon, my respected teachers and my dear friends. I'm Maria Jamal from Clinical Nutrition and Dietetics Department, Gokhil Memorial Girls College. I'm here to speak on the topic hemochromatosis. So I'm presenting my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible. Okay, ma'am. So, my topic is hemochromatosis. It is defined as a systemic iron overload where the absorption of dietary iron exceeds requirement. Here, the intestinal iron absorption is more than our body's requirement. Coming to the causes, there are four major causes of hemochromatosis. Number one is inherited autosomal recessive condition, which is the primary cause and is spread worldwide. 
Number two, hereditary hemochromatosis, which occurs due to mutation in the HFE gene that is leading that least uh, that regulates the absorption of iron by hepcidin. Number three, erythropoietic hemochromatosis. This is a condition in which the patient's body in which there is excessive production of red blood cells, which leads to more absorption of iron. And fourthly, excessive iron consumption that is through the diet. The types of hemochromatosis includes type 1 that is HFE related, which is the main cause. Type 2A that is mutation of hemoglobin gene. Type 2B mutations of the hepcidin gene. Type 3 mutations of the transferrin receptor 2 gene. And type 4 that is mutations of the ferroportin gene. So basically the hemochromatosis is classified on the mutations which is occurring. The symptoms of hemochromatosis includes arthritis or joint pain, arthralgias, that is again joint pain but with without swelling. In arthritis, swelling occurs. Lethargy, feeling lazy, fatigue or feeling tired, unexplained weight loss, abnormal bronze or gray skin color that is leading to skin hyperpigmentation, abdominal pain, abdominal pain, Phylonychia, that is a condition in which the nails become softer and appears spooked up. And this is mainly visible in the thumb and index fingers. And secondary diabetes. The effects of hemochromatosis include liver cirrhosis. This is visible in 70% of the patients with hemochromatosis. And if it is not treated earlier, it leads to hepatocellular carcinoma which eventually leads to death then cardiac dysfunction is also a effect of hemochromatosis this occurs due to iron deposition in the cardiac fiber uh, in the cardiac muscles and conduction fibers exocrine pancreatic insufficiency this causes diabetes mellitus and pancreatic toxicity it also leads to reduced output of amylase, lipase and trypsin with subsequent malabsorption, steatoria and other gastrointestinal consequences. Hypogonadism that is reduced secretion of testosterone in males and estrogen in females. Arthropathy that is a type of joint pain which occurs due to filling of calcium pyrophosphate in the synovial fluid. Impaired phagocytosis that occurs due to iron overload of macrophages and it leads to reduced immunity. The complications of hemochromatosis includes osteoporosis where the bone density decreases and the change is visible. Diabetes mellitus and hepatocellular carcinoma which is a result of liver cirrhosis if not treated. Arthritis can also occur if the synovial membrane gets thickened. Congestive heart disease and low testosterone in males. The diagnosis of hemochromatosis includes medical and family history, physical examination by stethoscope, blood test includes transferrin saturation test and serum ferritin test which measures the amount of transferrin and ferritin in the blood, liver biopsy and magnetic resonance imaging. The dietary management includes choosing a varied vegetarian, semi-vegetarian or flexitarian diet, consumption of more fruits and vegetables, protein-rich pulses and legumes, abstaining from red meat, choosing whole grain products, consuming vegetable oil and low fat dairy products, consumption of less sugar and salt and quenching thirst in water. I have got two recent research papers according to the topic. So the first research papers which was published in 2020 says that the test is which is better to diagnose hemochromatosis is transferrin saturation test 
because ferritin has low specificity for primary iron overloads. Transferrin saturation tests can be used more reliably to diagnose iron overload and in setting of elevated SF that is serum ferritin and help determine the need for genetic testing. According to the research paper which was published in 2021 which is the latest one it says both HFE and non-HFE related hemochromatosis leads to hepcidin deficiency which further leads to iron overload. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Maria. Anybody has any questions for her? Uh, I have a question for Maria. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, so uh, can you comment on uh, the vitamin C intake for a person suffering from this condition? Ma'am, can you repeat, please? I was unable to hear. Uh, I'm saying that can you comment on vitamin C intake for a person suffering from this condition? Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, in the dietary management of hemochromatosis, vitamin C should be avoided at much, as much as possible because vitamin C helps in iron absorption. Okay, correct. The fruits and vegetables which we are providing to the patient should be lesser in content of vitamin C. That's good. Maria, 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 yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Maria, you mentioned in your uh, presentation about transferrin and ferritin. Uh, uh, can you explain what is uh, what? How these two are related with iron? Ma'am, transferrin and ferritin are the two genes which are present on the mm -hmm. chromosome so when the mutation of these genes occurs it causes iron overload transferrin and ferritin are not the genes it's not gene and these are the uh, proteins which are present on the genes uh. Okay, which regulates iron absorption in the body. How? Mm, no. uh, when uh, Maria, when you are presenting something, you should know about. Uh, you should know uh, about the main things you are mentioning. You are mentioning transferrin and ferritin. You are mentioning that they are genes, but they are not genes. Iron in our body, how I, uh, do you know how uh, iron is stored in our body? Yes, ma'am. It is stored as in the form of hemosiderin in the liver. Uh, most iron is found in hemoglobin in our body no? and the rest is stored as ferritin so ferritin works as a storage for iron okay, okay. and iron needs transferrin is a protein and iron needs transferring to travel throughout the body okay, okay. you should read properly you should you should need more in-depth knowledge when you are when you are uh, talking about diseases. You know, clinical nutrition is our subject, so so we all should know about. It is our uh, it is our subject to know about diseases and how food and diseases interact. So, Maria, okay. I have a question for you. Actually, more than question, it's a doubt. Can you just show me your slide once again? Because there are two things in your slide which I did not understand. Yes, ma'am. I'm sure.
Can you go to the slide where you were talking about HAP? Yes, ma'am. You were talking about HAP in one of the slides. I think second or third slide. Yes, ma'am. In the types. Yes. Can you go to that slide, please? Ma'am, it was this in the types. But it's not showing. Only your uh, introduction slide is showing. The slide is not changing. You need to change your slide, please. Yes, ma'am. I am changing. Ta hotche na. Dakhu ekhane dakhche. Tomar blink korche korsar ta slide change hotche na. Okay. Anyways, ha. Ei to hotche. Ei jay. HFP. Yes. HFP related. You said type one. So what is this HFP? I did not understand this because you have not given any full form or any such thing. So, what is HAP? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, it is a protein. It is a human homeostatic iron regulator protein. In short, it is known as HFE. Human regulatory iron. Human homeostatic iron regulator protein. Okay. So that is known as HFE. So that is one type of hemochromatosis. So what happens in this type of hemochromatosis? And uh, mutation occurs in the uh, hexid. Uh, and there is a mutation which is occurring. You have to be more clear, as Ma'am also said regarding your topic. Okay, and one more slide where you have mentioned secondary diabetes. Can you go to that slide, please? Uh, I want to, ma'am. I just want to interrupt sure, sure. one more time. Actually, uh, HFE is an, also not a protein. Everything is not a protein, Maria. It's a protein coding gene. Uh, you just cannot say it's a protein. You need to be very much specified when you are talking about this. HFE Actually, a gulo odher to one kage theke mane cover kora hoye chhe because mm -hmm. genetics they have studied in mm -hmm. nutritional biochemistry. Yes, yes, they have also studied advanced nutrition already. Yes, yes, yes. But in spite of that, data yes. hoye arki mane concepts are not clear. Yes, HFE is a very everything is not protein. Or mane a bapata is. Um, Shop kichu the protein hai na? It's protein co uh, protein coding gene. So you need to be much much more specified when you are talking. Actually, coding a problem hai bolii code genetic code ta mutated hai bolii pura condition ta hai. So obviously the simple answer was the genetic code a difference ta hai jaye. Yes. CD code. Yes. 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 Arikta slide chilo tumar where you have spoken about secondary diabetes. Can you please go to that slide? Yes, ma'am. And this one. No. Okay, yes. Symptoms. Secondary diabetes you are saying is one of the symptoms of hemochromatosis. So what is the secondary diabetes actually? And secondary diabetes occurs due to any underlying disease. Okay. Any disease which is present earlier, but hmm. this in turn causes diabetes. This is known as right. secondary diabetes. Absolutely. So, which type of diabetes is it? Like, is and it type one, type two? Is it ni? Is it, is it insipidus? Is it mellitus? Ma'am, it's diabetes mellitus, which is a symptom of hemochromatosis. And is it type one or type two? And type two. All right, thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you. Dr. Gautam Mahata, I had seen he was there. Is he still there? Gautam sir, apni aachin. I think he has left. Uh, Dr. Ivy, De. Ivy, De, apni aachin ki? Aachi. Ha ha. 
uh, I request you to say something about today's program. Share your views. Since uh, we have come towards the end of the program and students have finished their presentation for day one, um, I'd be madam if you could just share your views regarding today's program. Give your suggestions. Good evening, all of you. subject but still i can say students need to have uh, more of a, as they go older they study further they will definitely uh, improve on their knowledge but overall the presentation was very good interesting and we would like to know uh, further on this uh, uh, this hidden uh, hunger nutrients you know it's very interesting for all of us it seems uh, so the presentation was all right absolutely and uh, judges Shubhangi and uh, Ashmita are here. Shubhangi, Ashmita, Dr. Priyadashini Chakravarti are Dr. Priyadashini Chakravarti, yes. Ma so I hope you uh, liked the program today. It was an endeavor on the part of the CND department from our college. Uh, and we would again expect again in, a, in the future in such programs. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aghi Day. Uh, yes. Now I request judges to give the insights to share their views on today's program. So uh, Shubhangi Ghosh, could you kindly share your views regarding today's program? Ms. Shubhangi Ghosh. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, yeah, so first of all, it was a good effort by uh, every one of you. But I would just like to suggest that please focus on basic concepts, okay? Like sometimes we keep on focusing on the bigger picture and the basics grow really weak. This is what is the problem that you're facing, okay? In spite of presenting it well with proper articulation and research paper and everything, the basics, that should not be the case, right? Okay, so let's just see to it. Because nowadays when patients come to you, they are very well off aware with the internet and everything. So if your basics is not strong, I think you will not be able to deliver properly to other people. So just from next time, please focus on that. And yeah, it was a good effort on your part. Keep doing such activities because we learn from our mistakes itself. All the best to all of you. Thank you so much, Shubhangi. Uh, I would request uh, Dr. Priyadarshini Chakravarti to share her insight on today's presentations. Dr. Chakravarti? Yes, yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a very good program. The presentations were very uh, good. Uh, uh, I just want to say one thing that uh, when you're presenting, you must be aware of all the um, terms and all the abbreviated terms that you're using. You must be aware of what you're saying. It's whatever you are using in your slides, you must be aware of all the uh, points and all the terms. Okay, so um, take care of that. Otherwise, the presentations were good. And as Shubhangi uh, told uh, uh, that concepts must be basic. Uh, 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 they must be basic and um, don't go for too high and uh, complex topics, which you are you yourself are, are unable to understand and make a clear a concept out of that. So stick to basic and then try to present your the topic as nice as possible as you can. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Pradeshini Chakravarti. Uh, lastly, Ashmita Bhattacharji, I request you to please share your views on today's program. Uh, Ms. Ashmita Bhattacharji. Yes, yes. I think uh, it is indeed a very uh, good effort from students. Uh, but I, uh, I completely agree what uh, Shubhangi said, that the basic concepts needs to be clear. Uh, the first thing and the second thing is um, you should be aware of what you are presenting. Uh, so apart from that, I think uh, it's a very good effort and I, 
I wish that you learn from all of your mistakes and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashmita. So basically, today's program was uh, just inverted. Like in the class, we teachers are teaching you today. We are learning from you. It's just the opposite. So yes, as all the judges said, even IB ma'am said, so there's a lot to learn. It's all about learning the basic thing that came out from today's presentations. Yes, there is a lot of effort from your side, of course, from the student side. But you need improvement in terms of basic concepts regarding what you're talking about. That I always keep telling them. So maybe the next day when you are presenting, that is day two, I think students should be more well prepared regarding their particular topic. You have to concentrate on presentation, like presentation quality definitely has to be good. But of course, you also have to concentrate on the concepts, on the in-depth knowledge of the topic. So thank you, everybody, including uh, IB Madam, Dr. IB Day, ICAC member, all the judges. Thank you so much for your precious time. And thank you all the teachers who were part of the program today, students without whom today's program could not have been successful. Thank you, everybody. And on the, from the part of the IQAC, Pratasha, thank you very much. I thank you also for organizing this sort of uh, program, which is very enlightening. And people need to know, all of us need to know about this. You know, it's thank not only so CNDB, uh, uh, you know, everybody needs to know about these things. It's everyday life we lead and we need all these things in our everyday daily life. Okay. Thank you. Thank, so thank you. you so much, Pratasha. Thank you. And the department and the students, they are still rising. You know, they are still on their ladder. They'll rise. They'll know. They'll be more conversant, I suppose. And wish them the very best. Thank you. And thank you, judges. All right. So I'm just Shubhangi ending. Shubhangi is a student, right? Yes, Shubhangi is our ex-student. Yes. Even yes. Uh, Oshmita and Dr. Pradeshi Chakravarti, they oh, all are ex-students. Okay, yes. okay, okay. Okay. But they are all established very well today in their own Yes, field. I heard so, yes. I heard so. Okay. Thank okay. you once again from Thank the you. IQAC. Thank seven. you, ma'am. So I'm just ending the presentation today. Yes, yes.